Welcome to session two, an introduction of a diagnostic reading and improvement program uh, for SEDN 658 Early Literacy Instruction 2, grades K through 2. So welcome to session two. Uh, let's get started. So this chapter is talking about uh, what is a diagnostic approach. Um, well, the diagnostic approach is using what we learn about students to solve reading issues that the children may have and understanding reading issues that they might have and also seeing reading successes. One way to do this is to have a hunch, is to see that a child is mouthing um, when they're reading and realizing that they're having a hunch that they're probably decoding. So then sitting down with them and diagnosing the problem, working with them and seeing if that's true, which is leading to evidence. So this is what we want to start out with, getting to know our children, um, getting some hunches, getting some ideas about what's going on, and then finding ways to, to find out if that's actually what's occurring. So the questions we want to ask ourselves when we have our hunch is, what do I want to know? Why do I want to know? And how can I best discover the information? So some ways that we can do this. Um, is by zooming in and zooming out. And when we're talking about zooming in and zooming out, what we're talking about zooming in is looking at the individual child. And one of the things that we can also do is zoom out and look at that child uh, in regards to the entire classroom, in regards to the age group, uh, in regards to the other children that are there that they're learning with. Um, one of the great things about this is it, it leads to lots of answers. When you zoom in and zoom out, if the individual child's not getting it and the entire classroom's not getting it, this is something that you need to address with the, the entire class. You can ask yourself lots of questions at that point. Is it developmental? Um, does it have to do with the makeup of the children? Does it have to do with your teaching style? Now, in order to sort of get an, an idea of what's going on, the first thing that we really want to think about is how do children learn to read and how we presenting learning to read. So there's lots of ways that teachers um, will teach children to read. One way is bottom up, which is decoding. So starting with the letters and the sounds, turning those letters and sound into words, turning them into sentences, and then learning a whole text. Um, the other way is top down, which is you're emphasizing meaning. You're starting with um, the whole text and then breaking it down sentence by sentence into words, into sounds. So really using that to find meaning. Um, interactive is understanding or coming up with the concept that both of these things are taking place together. Now, you may find yourself um, coming up with one or the other, preferring one or the other, using both, um, but it does help you to understand how you're teaching and how children are learning. Now, one of the things that we want to say is we want to, we, we always want to figure out um, how are children learning and are they proficient? And what are the characteristics of a proficient reader and a less proficient reader um, in your classroom? And some of the, the benchmarks we have here proficient, of proficient reading behaviors would be attempts to, to make what is read sound like language and make sense. Um, the less proficient reader is, is trying to identify the words correctly. So what that means is you'll see a child struggling over a word, whether another child um, it's trying to make sense of it in the sentence. Um, we, um, you can go through this list and you'll see it has a lot of very interesting sort of ways to see it. Um, another is uh, to correct miscues that affect reading, uh, affect meaning. So they're really, once we're doing the proficient reading behaviors, we're really looking for children to understand reading. They're not just decoding. Um, they're really trying to make sense of what they're reading and they understand that it's an entire concept not just an individual word. Um, so let's go on. Now, when we come to English language learners um, in a diagnostic approach, of course, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, and so really what they're trying to do here is trying to, to not just understand, not just read, and not just to decode, but really to understand meaning, to, to comprehend what they're reading. And one way of doing that is to really be incorporating their home languages, to understand what it means, to, to understand English and to, to be able to communicate their ideas, um, to understand comprehension. Um, and by the end, um, 
students are comprehending and engaging in conversational and academic English with proficiency. So we really want to start out, we, we see different levels starting out with just beginning to understand English, moving over towards the bridging where they really do understand it and they become proficient readers. Now, one of the things that we talk about quite a bit in this chapter are, are factors that affect reading performance. So there's two categories that we have uh, here. One is educational and one is non-educational. And this is something that you really need to think about too when you're using diagnostics, um, diagnostic approach in your classroom is, is what's holding them back an educational problem or a non-educational issue? So some of the educational issues that um, might come into play would be teaching methods. How are you teaching them? Are you just doing top, uh, the, the top up method? Are you doing the bottom? Um, uh, if a child is an auditory learner, or if a child is a visual learner, are those things that you're incorporating in your lesson. Um, the materials they're presenting, are they interesting? Are the children interested in them? The teachers, the teacher getting along with the kids, are the kids engaged in what's going on? How much time are you spending? on the reading program. Is there enough time for children to enjoy reading, to spend time reading on their own, or are they just spending very small amounts of time decoding? Um, the school environment, is it loud? Is it, um, is it supportive? Um, and really that always plays, in a, uh, an, uh, plays a role in terms of children's learning. Does the child have a diagnosed disability? Um, and that can definitely affect reading performance. Now we have some non-educational issues as well um, that you may not be able to control, um, you may not be able to influence, but it does give you insight into what's going on with the child's learning. So what is the home environment? Uh, are they homeless? Are they moving around a lot? Are parents fighting? Do they have a place where they can sit and read? Do they have access to books? Um, dialect language differences, are they, are they coming from an English language household? Um, that can make a big difference. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things is being bilingual, but it's also difficult for, for English language learners. They have, to, they have to gear up a little bit more. Um, boys, girls, I mean, gender always plays a role. Um, little girls tend to do better than little boys at this age, um, and that can play a role. Illness and nutrition. If children don't have full tummies, they can't learn. Um, if they are starving, they're thinking about their stomachs and they're not thinking about learning. And when you're talking about young children, there's a huge amount of poverty. Um, when we're talking about children uh, second grade and below. Um, in fact, they are one of the biggest groups of, um, of children in poverty are, are our youngest. So if they're not eating, they can't learn. Um, also, if they're sick, if they uh, aren't receiving good health care, if they have rotting teeth. You know, these are all things that the poverty affects, um, but not just poverty. I mean, this is something that children get all the time. If a child's sick that day, they're not really going to do well when you're giving them an assessment. Um, visual and auditory problems. Can they see the paper? Um, do they need glasses? Can they hear properly? They can't do either one of those things. If those haven't been diagnosed, that's going to be an issue with well, and that's actually something that you'll have a little bit of influence in, um, you know, making a referral to the parents, making a referral to the school nurse, um, because you'll, you might be the first to notice, um, especially when we're talking about visual and auditory problems, you may be the first to notice that there is something going on. And this is an important one, is the emotional self-concept, learned helplessness, motivation, and attitude. So some of the other things, we, we've actually just talked about many of these, um, but there's something to keep in mind when you are evaluating and doing diagnostics on your kids. So we talked about some issues. One of the other, the last issue really, and we've touched on this some, is the teacher, it's you. So you need to really make sure that you're giving every kid in your class a really good chance at succeeding. And, and some of the problems that we see are failing to ensure that students are prepared to learn the skills or the strategy. So giving them the building blocks that they need in order to move on to the next step and taking the time to do it. Sometimes we feel very rushed by all the things we have to get to during the year. But if you skip a step, your children will not be able to catch up. So taking the time and making sure everybody has the appropriate skills and strategy to move on to the next um, to the next uh, building block that they have to do in terms of reading. Using materials that are too difficult, um, you know, you have to make sure they're age appropriate. 
a lot of times things are made for children. If you're, if you're teaching kindergarten or first grade, a lot of times things are made for children third and above. Um, and you can hope to sort of change the materials, but you really need to have age appropriate materials. Pacing instructions, too fast or too slow. Um, ignoring unsatisfactory reading behaviors until they become habits. So the more that you're diagnosing, that you're using the diagnostic um, approach, that you keep looking at children, you're zooming in, you're zooming out, you're spending time working with children, trying to figure out what you want to know, you're going to see those behaviors. When you see them, don't wait. Go in there, start to change them. If you see children who are reading out loud and cannot yet internalize uh, reading, that's something you need to start working on. If you have a child that every time they see an E at the end of the sentence, they make the Y sound, that's a problem. You're going to have to nip it in the bud. Um, rarely ex expecting a certain child to perform same tasks required of others. Um, you can do that for many reasons. Um, that can be that you just don't think Johnny really, you know, is up to snuff with the other kids. Well, get that out of your head because children change every single day. Go in every day with, with a fresh slate with that child and make sure that you really keep that child up, up in terms of what's going on in the classroom. And if you can't, you need to put in strategies to really make sure that that child does what's needed of them. Because like I said, if you skip that step, you're going to really cause a problem with their learning as it goes on. This is a big one. Asking questions and then answering them without giving students time to respond. I always talk about Dora the Explorer. That's who I think of. She asks a question, what color are the boots? And she pauses. She pauses for a period of time that is almost uncomfortable. During that time, children are thinking of answers. The first question they ask themselves is, is, the child, is that teacher really asking me that question? Then they think, Oh, I guess they are. And then they start to ponder the question. So there's a lot, lot of steps involved. If you're talking about an English language learner um, child, they may be translating what you say. So give the children time. Also make sure that you are asking open-ended questions. If you're asking questions and you have the answer already in your mind and there's a right or a wrong answer, give them the answer. Don't bother that with the um, waiting for that. Questions should be open questions that really ask a child to think and give proper answers. Um, failing to acknowledge students oh, when they do try. So if Jenny raises her hand and she has never raised her hand before and she's going to try, she gets it wrong and you go right to the next student, she feels silly. You really have to make sure that when they try, even if they get it wrong, you let them know you tried. Great job. But let's see what we can do to make this answer you know, appropriate. Let's see what we can do um, to, to get you on the right track so that a child feels empowered that they tried, that you've given them that special um, understanding that you've taken a minute to acknowledge the effort that they've put in before you start to make the corrections. Oh, expressing disapproval or sarcasm when a mistake is made. There is absolutely no room for sarcasm in a classroom. Children are very fragile. They have very fragile egos, egos, even though it might not seem like they do. So children want to feel like they are doing the right thing and they don't understand sarcasm. So please be sweet to your children, be loving to your children. You may be the only ones who are giving them that. And it's really important to build their self-esteem because without self-esteem, they're not going to take risks. And without risks, they're not going to learn. Allowing other children to disparage another child's efforts. Don't let them make fun of them. Don't let them make feel badly. We really want to create a community of learners, which means it's a safe place. It's a safe place to make mistakes, and it's a safe place to try new things. Um, expecting a child to perform a task that he or she cannot do in front of others. So if Jenny doesn't want to read because she feels that she's going to make a mistake, find another way to give her that support so that she doesn't have to do it in front of others. Um, that when she does do it in front of others, she's empowered. And expecting a child to do poorly because older brothers and sisters did. And it's hard not to do that when you get to really know a family, if you're in the school year after year with the same kids coming through. But every child should come in as a blank slate every day, every year. Because really what we're here to do is to build up children's self-esteem, to make them part of a community, to understand that learning 
is fun. It's a place you can make mistakes. It's safe. And that's what you're creating in your classroom. So when you're doing, um, you're doing the diagnostic approach, it's not about using uh, these, these diagnostic uh, tools that you're going to learn about this semester um, to penalize children. The idea is when you find out what you need to know, when you have that hunch and you start to build evidence, you use, use that to scaffold, you use that to start to make decisions that can help children learn. Um, I hope you've enjoyed these chapters um, and enjoy session two. Thank you so much.